Okay, um, so today we're going over bonding. Now, um, lately what we've been talking about is more about just atoms by itself. So we're finally gonna go into how atoms can be kind of connected to each other. So if you see here, the main idea over how atoms bond together is this right here. Atoms will want to become stable by becoming like their closest noble gas. And the reason why is because noble gases have a full valence shell. And the way atoms do this is they're either going to give or take or share their valence electrons. So they're either gonna give, take, or share electrons. Um, so if I pull up a periodic table here, you can see, so in this example here, we're talking about sodium. So sodium's closest noble gas to itself is neon. So sodium is gonna do whatever it can to lose or gain electrons and become like its closest noble gas or become like neon. So in this case, you can see here, sodium is gonna lose this one electron And by losing this valence electron, it can get rid of an energy layer. And now it has a full outer shell like its closest noble gas, which in sodium's case would be neon. So you can see here, besides the protons, the amount of electrons that sodium now has is the exact same as neon. So they almost look like identical Bohr models. And because it lost an electron, it's going to now have an overall charge of positive one. So this is the first way. So um, electron or atoms can lose electrons. Atoms can also gain electrons to become like their closest noble gas. So in this case, chlorine, chlorine's closest noble gas is argon. So you can see here, chlorine is going to gain an electron. And now it goes from 17 electrons on the outside to 18 electrons on the outside. So again, it now has a full outer shell. Like its closest noble gas, which was argon. Yeah. Um, and now it also, since it gained an electron, it has a charge of minus one. So you can see this is the main idea that basically fuels almost all chemical reactions. Atoms want to have that full outer shell of electrons to become stable. Now, what you'll also notice here is that metals are oftentimes the atoms that will lose electrons and nonmetals are oftentimes the atoms that will gain electrons. And the reason for that is because the closest noble gas to a metal will always be the noble gas that comes before it. So in order to become like a noble gas before it, it needs to lose those electrons. Whereas non-metals, the closest noble gas will always be the noble gas that's um, after it. So non-metals will always want to gain electrons. And again, it's just because whatever is easier. So it's easier for a metal to just lose electrons than it is to gain um, electrons because it'll only have to like reduce its electrons by one in this case for sodium instead of gaining seven and then same thing for chlorine instead of losing these seven valence electrons it's just easier to gain one extra electron to get that full outer shell okay so atoms will usually form bonds to become more stable and when atoms form bonds by sharing their electrons, they become something called a molecule. So a molecule is basically just a group of atoms that are bonded through electrons. Um, and there's basically two ways that a chemical bond can form. So you can either give or take valence electrons. So this would be like transferring electrons, or you can share electrons. Now, whether um, a molecule is formed by give or transferring or by sharing electrons depends on whether you have metals, nonmetals, or metalloids in your chemical or in your molecular compound or your molecule. 
So if you see here, this is how the periodic table is kind of split up into metals and nonmetals. Um, metals are over here in red, and then nonmetals are over here in blue, metalloids in yellow. And then the only nonmetal that exists on the left side of the periodic table is hydrogen. So if you look here, um, this kind of like has periodic tables usually have this bolded line here, and that usually separates your metals to your left and your nonmetals to your right. For the periodic table that we use in our class, um, you can just look at the little legend right here. So even for like halogens, it doesn't specifically say nonmetal, but you should just know that a halogen is a nonmetal or same thing with the noble gases, right? Um, you can't like metals don't naturally form gases unless you heat them up to super high temperatures. And for this periodic table, how you can just look at it is the green section is the metalloids. So everything to the left will be your metals, everything to the right will be your nonmetals. And then um, hydrogen again is the only nonmetal that's listed on the metal part of the periodic table. Um, and okay, let's keep going. So there are three types of bonds that you can form. The first bond is an ionic bond. And ionic bonds form from metals and nonmetals. And the reason why this happens is an ionic bond is formed when atom one atom gives an electron and the other takes electrons or electrons, electron or electrons. So basically elements will trade electrons um, or they can transfer electrons. And usually the one that gives an electron will be the metal. The atom that takes an electron will be the nonmetal. Okay, the metal will also usually be the cation or the positive ion, and the nonmetal will be the anion. Okay, again, because when you give away an electron, you become positive, and then when you take an electron, you become negative. So here you can kind of see, right? You have sodium and chlorine. Again, sodium is your metal, chlorine is your nonmetal. So what happens is sodium wants to lose its electron to delete that outer shell. So it's going to trade or give away its electron to chlorine. And that makes perfect sense because chlorine also wants to receive an extra electron um, to get that full outer shell. So now on the bottom here, both atoms have full outer shells. And what's also interesting is now that sodium lost an electron, it has a positive charge. And since chlorine gained an electron, it has a negative charge. So there's also an electrostatic attraction in the ionic bond between these molecules or between these atoms. Since sodium is positive and chlorine is negative, they're going to be attracted to each other or they're going to stick together. So that would be your ionic bond when one gives away an electron, so metals give away, and then nonmetals receive or take electrons. So that's your first type of chemical bond. Your next type of chemical bond is something called a covalent or a molecular bond. And this is when atoms, instead of giving and taking away, they're going to share electrons. And this is usually formed from nonmetals. Um, and nonmetals. So if you see here, you have two hydrogen atoms. And what happens is instead of one giving away an electron and then the other one completely taking the electron, what they're going to do is they're actually going to share electrons. So now both of these are happy because this first atom or first hydrogen atom here has a full shell. And then the second, second hydrogen atom here also has a full shell. So by doing this, they can share their electrons and keep both sides happy. Um, so now both of them have full shells. So covalent bonds will form between nonmetals. And lastly, you have something called a metallic bond. So metallic bonds form only from metals. And Metallic bonds are formed when you delocalize your electrons. So what that means is instead of electrons belonging to one or another atom, they're literally going to 
kind of dissociate or delocalize. And basically what that means is they're going to just belong to everyone. So literally everyone just shares all their electrons. They don't belong to one atom or another. It's just shared throughout everything. So that oftentimes people will call that the electron C model because it's literally kind of like a sea of electrons that are just shared throughout numerous amounts of atoms. So try this example set, right? Um, you have ionic, covalent, or metallic bonds. Again, ionic is metal plus non-metal. Covalents are just non-metals and the metallic are just metals. So for example, lithium chloride, lithium, if you look, So lithium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, so this would be ionic. Sulfur and oxygen, these are both non-metals. So this would be covalent. And then silver, AG, that's just going to be um, a non I mean, a metal. So this would be a metallic bond. So let me launch this poll and you guys try the next ones on your own. Okay, so for hydrogen and sulfur, you can see hydrogen is a non-metal. It's the only non-metal um, on the metal part of the periodic table. And then sulfur is also a non-metal. So two non-metals, that would make a covalent bond. Um, copper atoms, so copper is obviously a metal. So that would give it a metallic bond. And then magnesium and fluorine. Magnesium is over here, it's a metal. Fluorine is a non-metal. That would make it an ionic bond. Okay, so we're gonna go over chemical formulas really quick. And a chemical formula just shows you the atoms in a molecule. So the number of atoms for a specific element is written as a subscript, sorry, it should say after, after the atom. So for example, if you have a nitrogen molecule with two nitrogen atoms, it's written as N subscript two. Um, and then for H2O, for water, you can see there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. So again, it's H2, so the two is for the hydrogens, and then it just has O. And you don't write H2O1, um, because if you don't have a subscript, you just automatically assume that there is only one of that atom, okay? If you write the one, that's technically like incorrect. No one writes that, because it's kind of redundant to put it. Um, so you just write H2 and then O. If you don't have a subscript, you're just saying there's only one of that element. Okay, so now we're going to get into um, forming ionic formulas or writing ionic formulas. So here's this chart for ionic charges. Um, you don't have to like, I mean, you have to memorize it, but you also don't have to memorize it. Um, and what I mean by that is basically the charges just kind of go along with whatever column you have in the periodic table, right? So column one, column two, 13, and then this would be 14, 15, 16, 17, um, 18. So columns one, two, and three will be plus one, plus two, and plus three. Sorry, columns one, two, and 13 will be plus one, plus two, plus three, respectively. And then um, you skip column 14, and I'll tell you a little bit later on why. And then columns uh, 15, 16, 17 will be minus three, minus two, minus one, respectively. Now, the reason for this is, again, because these ones are metals, so they like to lose electrons. Same thing here. And then over here, you have your non-metals, which want to gain electrons. And again, the charge is associated with how many electrons you want to lose or gain. So for example, right, um, lithium 
to become or have a full shell, you just need to lose one electron to become like its closest noble gas. Uh, calcium, you need to lose two electrons to become like its closest noble gas. Aluminum, you would need to lose three electrons. And then over here, same thing, um, but in the opposite manner. So like fluorine needs to gain one electron, oxygen would need to gain two electrons, and then nitrogen would need to gain three electrons to become like its closest noble gas. Uh, one other thing too is like column 14, you don't really see it form ionic compounds because it can either gain four electrons or lose four electrons. So either one would kind of work for it, um, which means that it's not going to have like a set pattern. Okay. And sorry if you guys can hear my dog barking. Um, yeah, just ignore that, hopefully. Okay. Uh, so steps for writing down an ionic compound. So we're only going to focus on ionic compounds right now. Um, the first step is you want to write down the symbols and ionic charges of the elements. And then you want to add atoms of specific elements until the net charges cancel out to zero. So I would say this is pretty much the most important step of writing an ionic formula. Um, and you're going to write the metal first and the non-metal after. And then once you figure out the quantity of each element, you're going to write it out as a subscript like we did above here. Okay, so I know it was a little bit confusing, but I'm going to just show you how that looks like and it should kind of click together. So lithium oxide, um, lithium, if you look at its ion, it forms a plus one ion, right? So I would have Li plus one or just plus. And then oxygen likes to form minus two ions. So O minus two. Okay, so right now what you're first gonna do is you're gonna see what net charge you form if you combine these two atoms. So if I combine these two atoms right now, your net charge is minus one. But when you're forming an ionic compound, you need to have a net charge of zero. So what you're gonna do is you can either add more lithiums or you can add more oxygens until your net charge is equal to zero. So if you look here, obviously since our net charge is minus one, we need to add another positive to balance it out. So if I add another lithium, now my net charge changes to zero. And once your net charge is zero, that means you're pretty much set. So now that my net charge is zero, all I need to do is combine these two and rewrite the formula. So I'm gonna write Li, Li is my metal, so that comes first. And then I'm gonna put as a subscript how many lithiums I have. So in this case, I would have two lithiums and then I would have one oxygen. And again, I don't write O1 because um, you assume that no subscript means just one of the atom. So Li2O, let me rewrite it so it's a little bit clearer. That would be my um, ionic formula. And you don't write charges in the final ionic formula. Okay, so you don't see me write like Li plus one, two, O minus two or something, right? Because first of all, that's way too messy. And second of all, since these balance out or cancel out to zero anyways, you don't need to write the charges, okay? So just make sure once you write your final ionic formula, you don't include charges. You just include how many of each atom that you have. So same thing with magnesium sulfide. This one's a little bit easier, right? So magnesium is a plus two charge. Sulfur is a minus two charge. So these are already balance out to zero. So you just need one of each atom. So my formula would just be MGS. Okay, for some reason, people like to write like MG2S2 but that would be wrong, okay? Because you only need one of each. Um, 
Okay, so I'm gonna have you guys try the next three on your own. And the, these two should be pretty easy. And then the aluminum oxide one might get a little bit trickier. But if you just keep adding um, atoms, it should kind of balance, just try to balance out your charges to zero and it should make sense. Okay, so potassium sulfide, this is kind of the same idea like that we did here, right? So potassium is plus one, sulfur or sulfide is minus two. So again, right now this adds up to minus one. So you would need one more potassium to get that to zero. So you would have K and then I have two potassiums and one sulfur. So that would be my formula. Um, gallium nitride, gallium is plus three. Nitrogen is minus three. So again, these already balance out to zero. So you would just need one of each. And then this one, aluminum oxide is the one that's kind of a little bit trickier. Um, so here you have aluminum plus three. Oxygen is minus two. So if you look here right now, this balances out to plus one. So you just keep adding um, atoms until you get to zero, right? So hold on, let me share results. So if I add an oxygen, that will get this now to minus one. And then I'll add another aluminum. So that'll get this to minus two. And then if I add one more oxygen, that'll finally cancel out my total charge to zero. So my final ionic formula would be Al, I would have two aluminums, right? So Al2O3. Okay, so continuing on, um, and then also there is a shortcut way to do this, but I don't like to include it just because like, I think it confuses some people in the end, but if you want to know the shortcut way, you can click, I think it's this writing ionic formulas um, YouTube video, and that'll kind of teach you the shortcut. Okay, so bonding character. So bonds are technically not technically mutually exclusive. So what that means is it's more like a spectrum. So you don't technically have like a completely ionic um, bond or like a completely covalent bond. It can kind of be like a spectrum. So if you have a large electronegativity difference, you're gonna be more likely to be an ionic bond or you're gonna have to be more ionic. Um, and remember electronegativity is how much an atom pulls an electron in a bond. So this should make sense, right? If you have one very electronegative atom and another atom that's not electronegative, then whichever one is very electronegative is gonna take the electron. Whichever one is not electronegative is gonna give away the electron. Um, and then here we have slight electronegativity difference and no electronegativity difference will determine whether you have a, co a, a polar covalent bond or a non-polar covalent bond. But don't worry so much about polar and nonpolar for now. Um, just note that if your electronegativity difference is either negligible or not existent, you're going to have a covalent bond. We'll talk more about polar and nonpolar a little bit later on. Okay, so this is what an uh, like an electronegativity periodic table looks like. You have all these different electronegativity values here, and you don't have to memorize this. Obviously, I'll give it to you if you need it. But basically, instead of just looking at whether you have a metal and a non-metal, you can just look at the electronegativity and take the difference from them to figure out whether they're ionic or covalent as well. So if you take the difference and the difference is greater than 1.7, then you have an ionic uh, bond. And then if it's less than 1.7, you would have a covalent bond. So for example, here, if we look at nitrogen, which has an ionic or a electronegativity value, of 3.0. And then hydrogen has an electronegativity difference of 2.1. So if I subtract these two, I should get an electronegativity difference of 0 0.9.
And this electronegativity difference is less than 1.7. So which means it's covalent. And you could double check, right? Nitrogen and hydrogen, nitrogen and hydrogen are both nonmetals. So um, if you subtract or if they form a bond, they should be covalent, which matches up to what we have here. Okay, and I would say when you take the difference, either just always subtract the larger one from the smaller one, or you can just take the absolute value, right? So the absolute value means no matter what um, answer you get, it's always gonna be a positive. So either take the absolute value or just do the bigger one minus the smaller number. Okay. Lastly, we're going to get into polyatomic ions. So polyatomic ions are basically ions that are made up of more than one atom. So a monatomic ion are the ions that we were talking about, and they're the ones that are like listed here, right? So like calcium, sodium, fluorine minus one. Um, but a polyatomic ion are ions that contain more than one atom. So like OH minus, NH4 plus, PO43 minus, these all have like multiple atoms connected together. Um, so your polyatomic ions, let me pull this up. These are your common polyatomic ions listed here. And if you were in my class, like we'll see if we meet in second semester, uh, but if we were in person, I would have you memorize them. Um, but obviously we're not, so you don't have to memorize them, but especially if you're gonna take AP Chem, you're gonna have to know these, but don't worry about it for now. Um, just know that they're basically like multi or polyatomic. Yeah, so they contain more than one atom. And when you write a polyatomic ionic formula, sometimes you might need to use parentheses to distinguish between the subscript within the polyatomic ion and the quantity of the polyatomic needed for the ionic formula. So this wording is very like confusing, but once I do these two for you guys, you should kind of see what I mean. Okay, so um, let's get this. I'm gonna do this one first because it's a little easier and then I'll go back to the, this example. So beryllium, if you look, um, beryllium is in column two, so it should have a plus two charge. And NO3 minus, it already gives me the charge here. So NO3 minus. Okay, and don't get confused. Like this minus just means minus one. Again, if there's no number, it just means one. And it doesn't mean that you multiply this minus one to these three. All it's saying is there's three oxygens in this polyatomic ion, and it has an overall charge of minus one. Okay, so don't multiply these two or anything. Um, so if I take the net charge right now, so you have plus two here and minus one here. Right now my net charge would be plus one. So again, you need to cancel or balance it out to zero. So I would need to add one more of my NO3 minus, and that would cancel it out to zero, right? So my overall formula for beryllium and NO3 minus would be BE NO3, right? And then I would have two NO3s. So I would put NO3 two. But if you look here, you can kind of see when you write the subscripts next to each other, it kind of looks like a 32. So in order to distinguish that you have two of these, you would put parentheses. And that's what I mean by this case over here. When you have a polyatomic ion, if you have more than one of them, you put a two after, or you put parentheses and then you put the subscript um, after it. Okay, so let me do one more example here. So you have barium. And if you look, barium again is also in column two. So it has a charge of plus two. And then phosphate is PO43 minus. So right now these balance out to a charge of minus one. So if I add another barium, this would change it to plus one. 
If I add another phosphate, this would change it to minus two and then add one more barium, that would change it to zero. So I would need three bariums and two PO4 three minuses. So again, I'm just gonna write down my formula, BA three, because I have three of these and then PO4 and I used two of these, so PO4 two. And then since um, I, this is a polyatomic ion, I need to use parentheses here. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Do the practice and you should be able to get it. Um, very last thing is diatomic elements. We'll go more about, or we'll go over the diatomic elements a little bit more in depth uh, later on. But diatomic elements are basically, right, monatomic means made up of one atom. So diatomic would mean made up of two atoms. So there's seven naturally forming diatomic elements in nature. H, O, F, N, B, R, I, and C, L. So what that means is in nature, if I took a sample of hydrogen gas and you looked at the atoms, what you would see is that you would never find a hydrogen atom by itself. It'll always be paired up with another hydrogen atom. So it'll always be H2. Or same thing with oxygen. If you literally took oxygen from your lungs, uh, you would find out that you don't have monatomic oxygen. You would have diatomic oxygen in nature. So you kind of need to memorize these. Um, and the quick way to do it is you just think of like the saying Hoff Brinkle, and that'll kind of help you memorize your diatomic elements. So H O F B R I N and C L. Always diatomic in nature, never monatomic. Um, and the reason why is because when they're diatomic in nature, it's because it forms full octets or shells. Um, so which allows them to be more stable, right? So if you have a hydrogen atom by itself, it has one electron, another hydrogen atom by itself. So if they are paired up like here, so instead of being monatomic, they're gonna pair up to become diatomic, okay? Same thing would happen with all of these here. Okay, um, and that's pretty much it for this lesson.